Morning. Good morning. And uh, because we're, we're Adventist, I'm going to begin with uh, a scriptural text, which I think is up upon one that's familiar to all of us, because it's found in Revelation, Revelation 20:12. And I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. <laughs> now, of course, one is the book of life, the other is the book of not life. Uh, but nevertheless, and you know, it's, uh, I don't really believe that God keeps records in books in heaven. It seems like a, an anthropomorphism, but nevertheless, it's striking to me that when God chooses to communicate something about the nature of judgment, he puts it in human terms, uh, in the terms of a library, a divine library. Uh, so there is, uh, there is something divine about the work that we do in keeping records, in maintaining uh, libraries. And perhaps at times we lose sight of that uh, in the mundane duties of uh, fighting for budgets and space, dealing with staff, dealing with cataloging and various issues, but it doesn't hurt to be reminded uh, of that, of that, uh, the essential nature of books in, uh, in salvation history, as well, of course, as the importance of books to Adventists because we are a people who have always read um, and continue to read. I occasionally hear it said that Adventists are not reading people, and I think that's very far from the truth. Uh, just to share with you something, that my, my wife uh, is from the Central Valley of California. Her parents uh, and her family are lovely Christian people, but they are farmers. She's the first one in her family to, to finish college. Um, but they read, they buy books, they, uh, they're always reading, even though her father is dyslexic. Uh, they are constantly reading, and my sense is that Adventists, from those who are extremely well educated to those who are not, are well, very well aware of the importance of books and are reading people. And so, you know, just a reminder that what we do is very uh, important, indeed essential, to the whole nature of our church. You'll see on the screen that my title uh, has changed, uh, which is a, a good conference standby, of course, that the title changes uh, somewhat. Uh, you'll see it's only a relatively minor edition, but it takes up a fair amount of my paper. But you'll see the edition is Brief History, so that as well as the current state and future prospects, it is now also a brief history. Because I ended up, as I wrote this paper, looking at how Adventist archives came into existence. And perhaps that I did that was inevitable, because I'm an historian. Uh, and so I inevitably also bring a different perspective to archives. Uh, I come, you, you're mostly on one side of the uh, equation, whereas I come from the other side. I'm sort of more typical of your clients, perhaps, than many of you here. Um, and so as an historian, inevitably, I wanted to see, well, how did this come into existence? But I'm going to share what I found with you, not just because it appeals to me personally as an historian, but also because it provides some valuable context. And as we will see, it provides an important point about the nature of archives. So my presentation is structured following the title in three parts. So they are of unequal length. The first part, which will take up around, I think, half the time, is a brief, or brief-ish, history of the emergence of Adventist archives. The second section is a succinct survey of existing historical source collections and attempts concisely to assess their strengths and weaknesses. And then I address the future. But if I can put it like this, I don't try to do so in a realistic fashion. I hope it's not unrealistic, but what I mean is I'm going to sketch out what I should like to see happen in the world of Adventist archives and manuscript libraries, and what I believe needs to happen in order for them to flourish. So that's the, how the, this uh, presentation will be structured. So first, to deal with history. And the primary focus here is records administration at the General Conference. So I'm just going to pause a moment. Joshua, is it possible to get what's on the PowerPoint up on that screen as well? Because then I don't constantly have to be looking over... Uh, my shoulder, and I see Jared is here, so he will be able to... For those of you who don't know, Jared is the in-house absolute expert on all things audiovisual and IT, and he is fortunately with us today, though he wasn't yesterday because it was the holiday, so thank you for your help, Jared. 
the ancestor of the Office of Archives, Statistics and Research is the statistical office that was founded in 1904 under Harvey Edson Rogers. So 1904 saw the position of GC Statistical Secretary established. Now Harvey Edson Rogers is an interesting person and librarians may know him best for his 1905 bestseller, or at least I presume it was a bestseller, The Rogers Compendium of the Graham System of Shorthand, seen here in the Google version. It's, yes, it has been digitized. More realistically, however, every librarian here really is aware of two serial publications which Rogers inaugurated. First, the Seventh-day Adventist Yearbook, a version of which had been published from 1883 through 1894, but then ceased, but it was revived and transformed by Rogers. And you see there both the first that he edited and the most recent edition, the 2014 edition. And the other publication is, of course, the annual statistical report, whose publication as a standalone version rather than an excerpt in the Adventist Review or the General Conference Bulletin was Roger's brainchild. Again, you see the first and the most recent. We're still hoping, actually, we may get the 2014 report to share with you uh, today, but uh, it, it's taking a little longer than we'd hoped to be printed. It's interesting that church leaders looked to youth when they appointed H.E. Rogers, who was only 36 when he was appointed the first statistical secretary of the General Conference. And you see him here in a more youthful uh, uh, picture. But Rogers has another first to his credit, one that I think probably reflects the fact that as an expert in shorthand, he was part of and then later head of the stenographic staff within the secretariat at the GC, which meant he went to every important Adventist meeting taking minutes. Um, and as a result of being at every important Adventist meeting for 40 years, he actually became the first Adventist photo bomber. <laughs> Seriously, Rogers appears in an extraordinary number of photos from the 1890s through the 1940s. He pops up everywhere from the famous picture of Ellen White preaching to the 1901 GC session at the Dime Tabernacle, can you spot him? Um, to this photograph of the stenographic staff at the 1903 session where he is sitting next to C.C. Crisler, who was later Ellen White's secretary. Here he is, captured in an apparently intimate moment with President A.G. Daniels, but my favorite is this extraordinary photo of four past, present, and future GC presidents uh, you can see here A.G. Daniels with his two predecessors, uh, George Irwin and Ola Olson, and uh, a future GC president, Daniels' eventual successor, W.A. Spicer, but right at the back, just where you expect a photo bomber to appear, is A.G. Rogers. <laughs> now, as we will see shortly, the position of GC archivist was not formally created until 1973, but given that Rogers was blessed by a diverse skill set, as we've seen, it may not come as a surprise that the first attempt to manage records began in the statistical office in the 1940s. Now, this may come as a surprise because the accepted wisdom about the GC archives is that it was founded as a result of the first meeting of our sister association, the Association of Seventh-day Adventist Historians, or ASDA. According to the ASDA website, one of ASDA's initial actions was to one of their initial actions was to recommend to the General Conference to establish an archive available to researchers. And no less a source than F. Donald Yost, the first archivist of the General Conference, we'll be coming back to, has stated that Arthur White attended that first ASDA meeting and that the denominational college history teachers prevailed upon him to use his influence with the brethren of the GC. And I've heard a similar story from two senior Adventist historians. Thank you. Um, and yet, despite this impressive oral tradition that ASDA is the start, is, is the reason that the archives were founded, Gershwin's lyrics come to mind, it ain't necessarily so. Or to be more precise, it certainly ain't so. The story of how the GC archives came to be founded is of interest, not least because it suggests that it provided an important impulse for the founding of the Andrews University collection, as we'll see in a moment. But also because it is, as we will see, a neat illustration of the very point of having an archive. 
I may say that this story, by the way, I've chiefly recovered from minutes of a range of committees, and so it also illustrates how history can be written from those apparently driest of sources, committee minutes. Now, consideration to establishing a general conference archive was first given in 1946. In the spring of that year, the general conference officers voted to recommend that a department of archives be established to properly look after our legal documents and obtain copies of all deeds and legal papers from all divisions to be on file here in the general conference office. So that's the spring of 1946. However, 18 months later, another officer's meeting agenda included an item with the title Central Denominational Archives Depository, but the officers voted to refer that to the Institutional Planning Board. And yet, though nothing more was heard of creating a Central Denominational Archive, work was done on the records of the General Conference under the direction of Claude Conard, who was at this time the Statistical Secretary. And we know that by 1953 there was a collection of records of some kind held in the statistical office. For that year, the General Conference Executive Committee voted to release to the seminary library not only the former General Conference Library, but also what are described in the minutes as the collections in the vaults of the statistical office, the upper and the lower vaults, according to the survey and record prepared by Claude Conard on the date of February 12, 1950, and the card files and lists belonging thereto. So the first General Conference archival finding aid dates to February 12, 1950, and Claude Conard. Now, I think some of those listed items in the card files and the lists that are referred to there are were probably published materials because they're creating the seminary, seminary library, but the reference to vaults indicates that records were included. And since the seminary library was transferred to Andrews University, I strongly suspect that some of the collections in Carr actually came as a benison from Claude Conard, uh, another of my predecessors. So they're really all ours, Merlin, and we want them back. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is a GC executive committee to saying we will give them to the seminary library, so it can't be undone, because it's the law of the Medes and Persians and the <laughs> GC executive committee. In the midnight, but interesting, so this is the, we know that there's a kind of records management program going on, uh, probably not a very well organized one, but there's something happening, and it's in the statistical office. As to why it's in the statistical office, that's an interesting question, but that is, seems to where it was taking place. Now, in the mid-1950s, there was renewed discussion of establishing a proper archive. In 1955, E.D. Dick, who was then dean of the seminary, wrote, or president, in fact, at that stage was the title of the seminary, wrote to the GC officers to suggest that, and hopefully you can see the, the quotation there, to suggest that in planning for denominational archives, they be planned for in the new seminary building. And this, of course, reveals that the concept of founding an archive had been the subject of previous discussion. However, at the same officers meeting that discussed the letter from Dick, the minutes tell us that a number of questions were raised, and the upshot, it was agreed to hold the matter in abeyance. And the abeyance lasted another decade and a half. But that brings that we come to the 1970s and to the formal creation of the General Conference Archives in 1973 and then to its uh, merging with the Statistical Office in 1975. But not only does the standard story about ASDA sparking the creation miss these important precursors of the 40s and 50s, it also does not get right how the archives were actually finally founded in 1973 because the oral tradition says that in December 1972, Adventist historians attending the annual conference of the American Historical Association, which that we hear was in New Orleans, held their own meeting with Arthur White, the secretary of the Ellen G. White estate in attendance. And this is when the college history teachers purportedly pleaded with White to use his influence to open to scholars the records of denominational history held at the general conference. 
The problem with this is that ASDA was not actually founded until December 1973, a year later. Now, of course, it's possible that there was an informal uh, meeting that preceded the formal founding of ASDA and that it was this which Arthur White attended. But unfortunately, the idea that Adventist academic historians can claim the credit for creating the GC archives is just not credible. I wish it were, because I'm an Adventist historian, and it would be nice if it were true. Um, but it, it, it isn't. Because the truth is that the establishment of the archives of the General Conference in 1973 was, like most administrative decisions at the General Conference, a long time in the making. In May 1971, the statistical department wrote to the GC officers to ask whether there is interest in having someone from the department uh, attend the Archivist Institute to be held in Washington, D.C., June 7 to 18, 1971. And the officers, after discussion, voted to express to the statistical department appreciation for what is being done on the matter of archives and records under present unfavorable circumstances. So it's clear that a kind of ad hoc records management was taking place in the GC under the aegis of the statistical secretary as had been the case in the 50s. So there's probably continuity there across 20 years. But what is notable, however, in uh, May of 71, is that the officers ultimately demurred. They said, no, we won't send someone from the statistical department to this archivist institute that's going to be held in Washington, D.C. But the reason is striking, because they minuted the whole subject of general conference archives and archivists is now under study. Consequently, they agreed that until a decision is made on the larger question of denominational archives, it is not necessary for anyone to attend the Institute. So we know that by the spring of 1971, at least 18 months before ASDA's potential first meeting, maybe two and a half years, the question of whether there should be a proper archive and records management program, one, rather than the one that was being conducted under unfavorable circumstances, that this was a matter already under study by General Conference administration. And four months later, in September 1971, this is the second quotation on the screen, the Associate Secretary of the GC, D.H. Barsh, brought an item to the offices. In the agenda and minutes, it is headed Historical Documents, Archives and Archivists. The Special Items Committee has recommended that the General Conference Executive Committee give favorable consideration to the employment of an archivist at headquarters to organize and care for church historical documents in possession of the General Conference. Further to which it's minuted agreed to ask the Special Items Committee to give further study to headquarters archive materials with the suggestion that more detailed proposals be submitted which should offer suggestions about personal financing, space, etc. before the subject is presented to the General Conference Committee. So for those of you unfamiliar with how the church works, this is very typical. A committee presents a report to another committee and the committee says, yes, that's good, give us a further report. <laughs> but at least they were saying this time, you know, the special items committee has presented an in principle recommendation and the officers are saying, yes, we like it, give us a detailed proposal. But things are rarely rushed, either in this building or in its predecessors at Tacoma Park and well over a year passed before a report was brought back to the officers. But in January 1973, they finally received the second report from the Special Items Committee. That actually sounds rather sinister, don't you think? The Special Items Committee, it sounds like what would actually oversee the Adventist equivalent of MI6 or the CIA. Um, but not quite that exciting. Now, the Special Interest Committee's, Special Items Committee's terms of reference in this area had been narrowed a little Quote, to give study to the subject of headquarters archives material and the need for an archivist at headquarters. And its report was to create another committee. This is very typical. Um, the report noted it is felt that this responsibility should be transferred to an ad hoc committee with the suggestion that recommendations be made for the care of correspondence and denominational records and that an archivist for the general conference be favorably considered. And so the officers appointed, as you can see, an ad hoc 
Archives Archivist Committee. Now, it may seem like they were not taking a decision, but actually, again, once you know how this place works, they are making a decision, because the chair of this committee, this ad hoc committee, was Willis J. Hackett, a general vice president of the General Conference, and the other members were C.O. Franz, the General Conference Secretary, Barsh, the Associate Secretary, M.E. Kemmerer, the Under-Treasurer, and Arthur L. White, the Secretary of the E.G. White Estate. Now, that high-powered membership, along with the terms of reference that was given to the ad hoc committee by the officers, signals, I think, that the committee's real role was not to say, should we have an archives and an archivist? Rather, it was to decide what an archivist's responsibilities would be and to identify how to fund an archivist and who should be appointed to the potentially sensitive post. But I think it is highlighting Arthur L. White's involvement here and uh, I suspect that this is where the oral tradition and the documents come together. Um, I suspect that in fact Arthur White had met with the hist Adventist historians, but that his role was not to say, he didn't suddenly say to the GC, yes we need to have an archive, and they said, oh yes, right, let's do it. Rather, they were already planning to create an archive, but White was able to say the archive we create should not just be in-house, it should be made accessible to Adventist scholars. That, to me, is the best way of bringing together the documentary and the oral evidence. And certainly one of the key points about the GC archivists is that it was made available to outside researchers. To come back to the, the record, sometime in that spring, Probably around April 1973, F. Donald Yost, then the editor of Insight magazine, was visited by Willis Hackett and told of the plans to create an archive and asked whether he would be interested in becoming the archivist. But the major step forward came in April 1973 when the Ad Hoc Archives Archivist Committee, appointed by the GC officers in January, presented to the 1973 spring meeting of the GC Executive Committee a report on the need within our church for an archivist here at the headquarters office. And it recommended the appointment of an archivist observing this service will be of great value in caring for our documents and records, etc., that have historical and cultural value to the church. And it's worth just pondering on that a moment. It doesn't say that we'll help the administration be better. The scope is broadening documents that will have historical and cultural value to the church. The minutes do not record any discussions about the recommendation, but the upshot was that the executive committee duly voted that the general conference make available a budget from emergency funds for the remainder of 1973 and the budgetary provisions be made for a full-time archivist for 1974 and thereafter as part of the general conference staff. But they then, other recommendations that had come from the ad hoc committee were referred to the GC officers, and they duly acted on May 30 to recommend to the personnel committee that Don Yost of the Review and Herald be invited to serve as General Conference Archivist. Now, it took a few days for the personnel committee to process and reach an agreement with the Review and Herald for whom Yost worked, but on June 6, 1973, Yost was formally asked to accept appointment as the first General Conference archivist, and he started on July 1st, 1973, something we celebrated last year because it was the 40th anniversary. Now, in 1975, the existing statistical secretary, Jesse Gibson, retired at the GC session, and at that point the statistical office and the archives were merged under Yost as director of the new Office of Archives, Statistics and Research. So just to remind ourselves of the, uh, the, the historical development from 1904 through to 1975 when archives and statistics were combined. And at, you know, so I know some people sort of think, well, why archives and statistics? Part of the reason is actually that the statistical office was dealing with archives and records before that. Uh, 
Partly, I think it's just sort of, oh, one is retiring, we may as well bring these two together. They don't, neither of them fit very well anywhere else, but part of it is that the statistical office had been dealing with the archives. And so F. Donald Yost was the first GC archivist and then director of archives, statistics, and research for a further 20 years, and he created the system of record groups that we still use in the GC archives and record center today, and a system that has been copied throughout the Adventist world. So Yost's influence uh, is still felt today and is uh, extremely uh, significant. Now, I'm drawing here to the end of uh, the history, but part of this history is interesting because it shows how the concept of an archive, of in fact a records and information management program at the General Conference, gradually developed. And of course the concept has continued to evolve and develop since then. Now, for example, we are involved in digital archiving to a very considerable extent, and the staff of the General Conference Archives and Records Centre is actually larger than at any time in its history. But please note that this story, as well as illustrating how things gradually evolve and develop, also illustrates another point, which is the value of archives for history. Because the oral tradition about the origins of the archive is very clear. I have heard it from several uh, senior uh, figures, and they're all, they all agree. And so one might assume, well, this is very clear, it's not contradictory, it's multiple sources, it's people who should know. And so the assumption has been, well, it must be correct. But the existence of the documentary record enables us to capture a rather different story. Archives, in other words, make a difference. This illustrates, this story illustrates the very reason why it's important to have archives uh, because oral traditions are not always reliable. And I could illustrate that further, but time doesn't permit, but we worked on uh, how the fundamental beliefs came to be drafted because they are under review and the committee that's reviewing them asked us to say, well, do we know why the form of words that was chosen was chosen? And actually, this is probably one of the best documented uh, stories in church history. We have innumerable drafts and correspondence about it. But the chief source up until now on how the fundamental beliefs were written has been the reminiscences of Fritz Guy and Larry Geraghty. Now, both of them, I believe, I think, uh, were being completely honest and straightforward in what they say they remembered, but the problem is not necessarily with duplicity, it is that human memory is fallible. Um, I won't say that documents don't lie. Historians in recent years have come to talk about fiction in the archives, uh, but they are contemporary and they give us a different picture, especially when they survive in good, uh, a good volume. So just to finish the, the story, in 2011 the then Office of Assessment and Program Effectiveness was merged with AST, and that is how we became the Office of Archives, Statistics, and Research. Let's move on then from the history to the current state of Adventist archives. These are just some reflections and observations. I'm about to show you a picture that is taken in a real Adventist library. Um, I won't say where, but it's a picture, I, I saw it and I just had to take a, a photo on those days with my cell phone, I wasn't very good, so it's not well focused, but you can see <laughs> you are entering a quilt area. I saw it and thought, that's brilliant, there's a quilt room in a Adventist library. Of course there isn't, it's a quiet area, so quiet that nobody notices that two strokes have fallen off the letter E creating a quilt area. How many quilt rooms are there in Adventist libraries or Adventist archives? Because, you know, one of the things as uh, my assistant director, Peter Chiamenti, who some of you will know and I hope would be here, but um, the cat is retiring next year at session because he's over 66. Uh, what a concept. Uh, and was retiring to the Upper Peninsula of Michigan and needed to do work on his retirement home, and so he's, he's away the whole of this month. Um, but as Peter and I travel, one of the things we repeatedly say is the value 
um, of information is in relationship to its accessibility. If there is a wonderful collection of minutes and letters, but it is in a room that nobody knows is a record centre, and therefore maybe thinks is a quilt room, um, or the collection is in a state of chaos, then it is almost as bad as if they had been thrown away and never kept at all. Except, of course, that there is the chance of doing something better with them in the future. Now, this is not hypothetical. I could give you stories. I'll just briefly reference the, the, the Ottoman Turkish archives and the Spanish archives. Both were in a state of chaos until relatively recently. And so our understanding of the history of the early modern Spanish Empire, which, remember, was a globe-spanning empire, the first global empire, and the Ottoman Turks, who were the superpower of the early modern era, uh, and also significant in biblical prophecy, um, the history of those two empires has really been transformed in the last 30 to 40 years. The records had always been there, but it was only in that period that they began to be catalogued, accession, made available. Up until that point, it was almost as if the documents didn't exist. Indeed, last, uh, not last month, in May, um, Peter Kimmins and I were in South Africa helping the division there to establish a records management program. Um, we worked through one of their vaults, which was next door to the president's office, and found their documents relating to an issue that the president was immediately and significantly interested in. And it was perfect, actually, because I was able to use it as an object lesson and say, you see, the documents were here the whole time, but you had no idea that they were here. You see why there's its value to invest in this. And the lesson was um, duly taken, I think. So it's not enough to have archives. They have to be well organized and accessible. Now, to be fair, this is beginning to happen. Before 1973, Manuscript sources were available to Adventist historians only in the LMG White Estate offices and the archive of the Review and Herald. Uh, some of you will know Rick Blondos, uh, who works at the National Archives and wrote uh, a dissert, um, I think a master's level dissertation or thesis on Adventist archives back in the 70s, um, and, and just confirms the, the how few resources were available. And it's striking, for example, if we look at some of you will know Gary Land's edited collection, Adventism in America. Most of the chapters in that book actually cite only published sources. And for an historian, that's, that's really not very good. Richard Schwartz's chapter, The Perils of Growth, he covers 1886 to 1905, stands out because he cites manuscript archival sources but almost all of them were from the Review and Herald Publishing Association archive because though it was published in 86, the research was done earlier and there just hadn't been the access at that time. There are a few couple of things that get uh, from the GC archives, but I think he added them later. So, but Schwartz was doing pioneering research in the Review and Herald, but so there really weren't many options. Creating the General Conference archives and the key decision to admit historians, to allow them to use it, I think has transformed Adventist history. The widely read work of George Knight and Gil Valentine, just to single out two, would have been impossible or would be much the poorer if they had not been able to use the General Conference archives. And of course there are other scholars who are using the resources as well, but those two in particular um, who have been so influential in the last 25 years. And so now it is accepted. I think it's widely accepted, not universally, but it's widely accepted that Adventist scholars can have access to original documents, except of course for very recent materials. And so in addition to the GC archives, in addition to the burgeoning network of LMG White Estates centers, other collections are beginning to emerge. People are seeing the value. Church members are now being encouraged to donate family papers to libraries and to archives. They're starting to donate money for that purpose as well. So there is a growing momentum, I would like to think. And, that, and so I believe we can look forward to richer, more detailed and more nuanced histories of Adventism. Uh, and not only histories that go deeper, but also a broader historiography, because Adventist historiography, and I touched on this, we had a conference with ASDA here in January, and Adventist historiography is really rather circumscribed. It tends to go in just a few channels, 
Uh, and I would like that river of Adventist history to burst its banks uh, and become much wider. And I believe that will be possible because the source materials are becoming available. Let's just review, and if I miss an important collection that you happen to curate, then I apologize. These are the ones of which I'm aware. There's the General Commons Archives and Records Center. There's the Review and Herald Publishing Association, though of course one has to say what's going to happen with its archive. Um, at the moment it looks very likely that it will mostly be moved here, because it's a GC institution. There's the Center for, Research at Adventist, Center for Adventist Research at Andrews University, of course, Carr, there's the Loma Linda University Library. Oakwood University Library has important collections on the history of, uh, of our work among African Americans. Increasingly, there are some division archives, and I'm drawing here the distinction between an archive and a record center, which I hope uh, you're, you're familiar with. There's the European Adventist archives at Friedenzau and the Archiv Historique de l'Adventisme Francophone at Collange. These are both inter-European division EUD archives, one for the German language, one for the French language. Uh, Friedenzau is the stronger of these. Uh, neither of them are, uh, are terribly strong, partly because so many German language documents were lost during the war. There's the Adventist Heritage Center at Kurenbaum. We are glad to have Rosalie with us, which in effect, to some extent, serves as the SPD Historic Archive. And in progress, in the process of creation, at Helderberg College, there is the Vessels Library. And I saw Gail earlier. There she is, Gail. We're delighted to have you with us. Who's the head of the Vessels Library at Helderberg. But there's also an Ellen White Research Center based there, which is a division institution. But those two institutions are drawing together to become the basis for a new Southern Africa historical archive. And having visited in May, I was just uh, my, I, I was salivating at the richness of some and the age of some of their documents. And was like, give me a week and I'll write a history of the church in South Africa up to 1940. Um, but other people can do that better. Uh, but those those plans are in progress. And in addition, there are plans. I have to say, somewhat sketchy plans at the moment. But one still one hopes they'll develop to make the Ellen White Center at UNASPI, the Adventist University of Sao Paulo, the South American Division Historical Archive. I would say that even though the South American Division is sort of a model for the world church in many ways, its archives and records management program is not so strong. In, the division, in addition, there are a number of strong division record centers, not uh, just the historical archive now, but record centers. The Southern Asia Pacific Division Record Center at uh, SSD in the Philippines is especially good. The South Pacific Division Archive in the division headquarters, though, in effect, I think that's, it sort of blurs the lines between a record center and an archive. Uh, in progress, the West Central Africa Division Record Center is expanding. At the moment, it's, it's basically a, a small file room, but they have some ambitious plans. Um, and they keep asking us to come to Ivory Coast, which I've done once and don't feel like doing again, so I'll probably send one of my staff. I'm looking at you, Benjamin. Uh, uh, and also, the Southern Africa Indian Ocean Division is, as well as creating an historic archive, is, as I mentioned, creating a very good record center. We were there, and they are investing quite substantially in that. In fact, uh, their commitment uh, to wanting every one of their unions to have a record center, and every one of their conferences and missions to have a record center, uh, was, was admirable and is better than many divisions in the world. Then, of course, there are a number of other institutions and collections. The Pacific Union College Library with the developing Walter Art Center for Adventist History, Newbold College Library, Union College Library, the Ellen White Research Center at Avondale has a number. Of course, you know, all the Ellen White Research Centers have got copies of Ellen White's papers, but then everyone who has the Internet will have those by the end of next year. Uh, some Ellen White research centers, but not others, have strong manuscript collections. Some of them, so quite a number, basically have almost nothing other than the photocopies. Uh, the one of Avondale, thanks to, largely to the work of Arthur Patrick 25, 30 years ago, uh, is very strong. And as I mentioned, the one in South Africa is also good. And also, I have to mention here the James Nix personal collection, uh, which is probably one of the best collections in Adventism. There are different strengths. Carr, for example, at Andrews is and will remain a depository of records, so to speak, with strengths in all areas. They collect in all areas. But in addition, for example, Loma Linda has strength in the history of the medical work, amongst other things. PUC is strong in collections on the doctrinal and other controversies of the mid to late 1970s and the early 1980s. 
um, partly because, of course, many of those controversies were centred on Pacific Union College. Um, but they actually have got contemporary records. And if you know anyone who's planning to write on the Ford crisis, for example, they have to visit PUC and work through the UT correspondence in particular, which gives you an almost week-by-week, play-by-play commentary of what's happening, as opposed, again, to people's recollections, which are fallible. Uh, the PUC has also got, uh, the, the UT Center is also has very good collections relating to mission work in Asia Pacific. Southwestern Adventist University has got strength in the history of Adventism in the southwestern region of the USA, and also uh, some things from outside that. For example, a wonderful diary, which some of you uh, who've attended our anniversary conference heard Carl Wilcox speak on. Union College, of course, has got these extraordinary manuscripts on the history of the church in China. And speaking personally, it's probably just my English prejudice, but I wouldn't have thought to go to Nebraska to research the history of the church in China. <laughs> Newbold has strengths in Adventist history, not only in Britain and Northern Europe, as you might expect, but also West Africa, because it used to be part of the Northern European West Africa division, and uh, wonderful sources on the history of the Middle East. That's just a few examples. So historical source con- collections, however, are still very frequently undervalued. They often have to function with too limited resources and they are staffed by people who have little or no training specific to archives, records, and so on. And I, would, I could give you, I have, a list of, I, list, I have a list of horror stories which I won't share with you at this point, uh, but I do keep a list now of just even the last 25 years, conferences, unions, um, which burned their records. In one case, a union president personally lit a, lit a bonfire and started to throw things onto it. Um, or things literally tossed into a dumpster. Because, hey, the board is coming soon, these are records, they're taking up space, who cares, what's the problem? Even today, church administrators make decisions about major changes in institutions with no thought for the fate of archival collections. I may say that um, this isn't here a subtle dig about the Review and Herald, because actually... Uh, The fate of the Review and Herald's archive has been considered from the first, um, but death, I could give you examples this year in North America with huge changes and people sort of suddenly noticing well into a process, gosh, there's actually that archive that takes up a vast space, what's going to happen to that? People just don't think about it. And in other places, even though there is an archive or a record center, Documents are lost because the staff are unqualified and make basic mistakes. Rosalie talked yesterday about dealing with mold and mildew, for example. Um, Too many places uh, don't think about humidity. But, you know, paper's great. Paper will be here long after we're gone, but not if you keep it in damp circumstances. That's the one thing paper doesn't like, of course. So there are still problems, and this leads me naturally to the future prospects. I'm going to set out here a vision for the future but it is a vision for the future that reflects the fact that in church policy, my position as archivist of the General Conference is actually gives me a kind of uh, wider assignment than just the GC Archives and Records Center itself. So these are, if you like, not just my own personal wish list, but this is, these are the view of someone who has been charged by the church with trying to take a wider and a global view. And I hope you will, to some extent at least, buy into it. Now, you may wonder, what is the GC archivist's role? When the GC archivist position was created, this is what one of the jobs that... The, the, there were six roles listed, and this was one of them. To develop cooperative working relationships with existing denominational archives and assist in the development of other research and archive centers. To coordinate resources for denominational research throughout the denomination so as to bring about the most serviceable utilization of existing denominational source materials. And so it's with that in mind that um, in an attempt to do justice to this that I'm going to set out a kind of vision. I will also say, by the way, just a reminder that the, the GC Archives has a wider role also in that church official policy has certain stipulations about records keeping not only by divisions, unions, conferences, and missions, but also by every institution, including colleges and universities. And, uh, for example, missions and institutions 
are supposed to meet these, and indeed a new union or conference or mission is not supposed to be organized until it demonstrates it can meet the standards we set for record keeping, that this is one of those laws more honored in the breach than the observance. But still it's there, and certain parts of the world now are beginning to follow through. And you can see that working policy has several sections. Um, sections on records management, records retention, vital records, which is the one you should all be familiar with, because it applies to you and your institution, BA 7015. Things on the ownership of records, on intellectual and property interests, and on implementation. These are just a few. But these, this, these are the sections of just the BA 70 section, but you can see there are other sections as well. So we have a kind of wider uh, remit here in the GC archives. So I'm going to set out now, very, relatively quickly, eight points, kind of global vision and global objectives. I'll just briefly list the eight and then go through them in a little more detail. First, I believe we need to consolidate rare and archival collections to achieve critical mass. This is within institutions. Maybe there's a case at consolidating institutions as well, but I'm not talking about that. I'm thinking about adopting different organizational models to achieve critical mass within institutions. Two, create a network of archives, by which I mean archives, record centers, manuscript collections at libraries. I create a network of those to allow for strategic decision making and strategic collecting. Three, create a network of Adventist archivists and manuscript librarians for professional development, etc. Four, to provide, and when I say to provide, it could be the GC because we're already doing it, but I think ASDAL has an important role here, and I'd like to think we could do it together, should provide more training for archivists, records managers, and manuscript librarians. Five, Create new resources. We need better inventories and guides to archival and manuscript collections. Because again, if people don't know they're there, they won't be used. Six, to encourage organizational units, that's unions, conferences, missions, to designate libraries in higher education institutions as their archives. Seven, to make available online in digital form the greatest possible number and variety of historical sources. And eight, to publicize archives and manuscript collections and make them seem relevant to church members of all ages. Let's just go through those. One, I think organization is a weakness. I think there are too many separate and overlapping archival manuscript and rare collections. Just to take one, Avondale College Library has a rare book collection. The E.G. White Research Center, which is not only at Avondale, but in the same building as the library, has both books and, as I mentioned, a significant collection of what it calls document files, historical manuscripts. But both the library and the White Center are institutionally distinct from each other and from the South Pacific Division Heritage Center, which again is not only at Avondale, but in the same building. And the record center at the division office is separate again, though Rosalie has now been appointed to direct both the uh, archive at the division office and the one at the Heritage Center, which is a step forward, but you basically have four separate uh, organizations to an extent. And I think this, and of course one could give other examples of this, I've just chosen to pick on Avondale partly because I was there recently. And I think the model that existed at Andrews with the Center for Adventist Research with Carr of integrating a library's rare books collection and manuscript collection the LMG White Center collection, and the university archives. This, to me, is not only excellent, but is, is, is kind of, why aren't we all doing that? There may be reasons, but I would recommend this model, and I would like to see it implemented more widely around the world. There are, of course, a number of places where there are LMG White Centers and libraries, and again, at Heldeberg, for example, the library is the colleges, which is a union institution. The White Center is a division institution. But they are beginning to work together more closely. And so sometimes we don't actually need to create a merged organizational structure. It can be enough to have informal cooperation. But the problem with that is, what if the staff change? It can all be lost. Two, a network of institutions. Now. I'm not calling here for the replacement of Asdol and Alice. I think they are absolutely essential and indispensable. But I do think there are challenges and issues that are unique to archives 
including record senders and library-based manuscript collections, challenges that are unique to them or are more typical of them than the mainstream typical work of libraries. And so it, it may be that one could create a separate network, but uh, that may not be necessary, but I think so. It may be that you know, one would want to create a, you know, a, a consortium of Adventist archives, um, but some kind of network, even if it's an informal one, that could perhaps meet yearly in conjunction with ASDAL and or as needed at other times, I think this could help to improve standards and it may offer other benefits. For example, libraries could agree in their collection policies to respect each other's strengths, and I went through some of those strengths in a previous slide, allowing for strategic cooperation rather than competition. I think we need specialization and working cooperatively not in competition. That's also true of digitization, of course. So where, if, your, if your library has a manuscript collection, but you don't have a significant geographical or subject-themed collection in certain, those, in certain areas, don't seek to build up the collections there. Work instead to build up the strengths you already have and honor the strengths that exist in other libraries. I can say, for example, um, uh, well, two years ago we received uh, a collection in the post, and it related to uh, W. I think it was W. C. Granger, the first Adventist missionary to Japan, who was president of Pacific Union College. I sent it to uh, Pacific Union College for their collection because he was the president of PUC, and also he was the first missionary to Japan, and they have a strength in Asia Pacific. Um, I have received letters from people saying, "Oh, I've got these papers relating to an Adventist hospital or doctor," and I've said please send them to Loma Linda. And I think if we could all do that, uh, it would mean that we would have a greater strength across the system as a whole. As an historian, I can tell you one of the most frustrating things is collections being spread across the world. For example, you know, and I, I personally regret the fact that in the early 20th century, universities seemed to think, oh, if we're going to be a proper university and a research institution, we have to buy manuscripts. And so I can tell you, for example, the papers of Sir Francis Walsing and Elizabeth, the first Secretary of State, you have to go not only to the National Archives, uh, to one of the great historic houses of the United Kingdom, you also have to go to Brigham Young University Library and the University of South Australia Library in Adelaide. Um, it's very annoying, especially because it's, you know, it's three different continents. Who can afford to do that? Um, so let's not end up creating something like that. Let's acknowledge we're all part on the same team here. We're not rivals. Some of us have strengths. Let's honor them. Let's point potential donors to those. And if we all do that, we can build up a stronger system as a whole. But as well as a network of institutions, I think we need a network of individuals, a network of archivists, records administrators and records managers, and manuscript librarians, which would help to provide support for what currently are often very isolated positions. And it could also help provide professional development, which is essential because very often librarians who have no archival or records management training are assigned to archival collections. I'm not going to single you out here, but I'm thinking of people, I'm carefully not looking at anyone. Um, but I know people here who are in that situation. So you need help. And I think, again, it's a sort of meeting that could take place in conjunction with ASDAL or as needed. I mean, for example, at GC Session, lots of people are coming together from across the world. One could do that every five years or occasionally organize a separate meeting as well as having a meeting during the ASDAL meeting. And this points to a, the need of more training in general. You all know, I think, that Adventist education is expanding dramatically. In fact, we might say it's exploding. And very often, libraries are not being given the resources they need. You know that. And those of us who were at IAS heard it very clearly from the strong group of Southeast Asian librarians who attended. They have, at, at Jim, I think, remarked yesterday that we go to some places and the resources they have wouldn't even be a good academy library in the Western world, or high school library in the Western world. But historical source collections, archives, often receive even less resources in the general library. So there is a systemic problem of under-trained staff as well as under-resourced institutions. And it's worse, it's, it's true of all libraries, but it's worse for archives and manuscript collections. Now, 
GC Archives already provides training in records and information management for divisions and unions. And I think ASDAL already works with libraries outside NAD. There was an interesting report, for example, in the material that was handed out. I forget the exact. It's coordinated for overseas libraries, I think something like that. So we're already doing things. ASDAL is already doing things. I think we could do more, and we could do more if we work together and collaboratively uh, to provide training for institutions that have archival collections so that we could start to go beyond divisions and unions um, and you could start to do more, and I would like to uh, have conversations about that. I think that way current training could be expanded and offered in a more systematic way, and that would mean that the skill sets of staff who are working in archives and records management could be greatly enhanced. I also think their personal self-esteem, their professional self-regard could be considerably enhanced, and that should be of interest to this association. This could be achieved by a concerted effort between the GC archives and ASDAL, and of course drawing in the networks that I'm suggesting should be created, the networks of institutions and of individuals. If we don't do that, archives will remain under-resourced, served by under-trained staff, and irreplaceable documents will continue to be lost to unnecessary mistakes. Five, we need more and better resources. For a start, more archives and libraries need to produce finding aids. And I was delighted to hear Laurie's paper yesterday. I didn't agree with all of it, but as I was describing it to my wife at, at home and saying it's an art, not a science, uh, and there aren't necessarily right answers. All of these things can be the right way to do it. Uh, and I greatly appreciated the fact that Laurie gave the paper at all and also had a number of things that, which everyone would agree with, even as one might subtly disagree on certain points. But we have started to do this. You'll see, you saw the, uh, the brochure and you're urging you to buy a copy of a new series of general conference finding aids. This is the fruit of the work I mentioned earlier, looking at the historical shaping of our fundamental beliefs, especially on fundamental belief number six, creation. And most of the work for that was done by Benjamin Baker, who I therefore would like to pay tribute to in this audience. So we need more finding aids, but also we need more than particular finding aids. For example, there hasn't been a researcher's guide to the GC archives for over 30 years. That's uh, a bad lacuna, and we're hoping to fill it. But we also need these wider guides to sources on Sabbatarian and Adventist history. Not just finding aids to particular collections, but sort of meta-finding aids, so to speak, guides to the finding aids. Um, I would like to see uh, guides to sources, including summaries of holdings, at least at collection level. Uh, because if you don't know, again, if people don't know sources are there, they're not going to study. Now, these kinds of finding aids exist for other denominations. Uh, they should exist for a church that is global and is increasingly growing. Now, initially, I think probably this sort of guide might just be to a guide to sources of Adventist history. Uh, in Adventist universities in North America, but then I would like to see an overall guide to the sources of Adventist history around the world. I think there's a potential opportunity for ASDAL and ASDA to work here because, of course, some of the chief consumers of this kind of material would be Adventist historians. And perhaps ASDAL could reach out to some of the sister societies, ASDA, ASRS, ATS. But we also need dedicated archives. And here again, I'm drawing the distinction between an archive and a record center. And I have to say, I'm encouraged by the number of record centers being founded. Partly, indeed, that we are traveling and helping to set up at divisions and unions. But the problem is a record center in a church headquarters will often be unable to handle historical research. And so I am encouraging church leaders, when I meet with them, to think about having an off-site historical archive. And I would like to encourage all of you, liaise with conference, mission, union, and division secretaries. It's the secretary who's responsible for records management, for fulfilling the provisions of policy on records management. And go to them and suggest that your library can become their des designated historical archive, as is happening in Southern Africa, Indian Ocean Division, where the division has said we will both have a well-resourced record center at the headquarters in Pretoria, but in addition we will have an historical archive for the whole of Southern Africa, not just division papers, at 
held a vote based in the LNG way centre. Uh, some of you would not be in a position to do this, I realise that, but some of you are. Some of you may be doing it on an informal basis, but in that case sign a memorandum of understanding with your local union division and formalise it, that at a certain period certain types of documents will be transferred to you, uh, which means you will then own them, they won't be transferred back. Um, because you are set up to have people come in and research, that's what a library does, whereas a conference or union office is not. So this would both improve the treatment of our archives and I think lead to better standards of preservation, but it would also promote research in the archival collections. Seven, let's make the Adventist Digital Library a reality, because we still need to make available online in digital forms a greater volume and a greater variety of historic sources. And at the moment, the ADL would mostly be published materials, but of course, as you know, on the EG wide estate is bringing out a wide variety of unpublished resources, and part of what's on Adventist archives is also uh, unpublished archival materials, and we hope to do more of that. And equally, CAR is digitizing their document files as well as books. So part of ADL is to expand and not only have published material, um, but also archival material. So it can be the Adventist Digital Archive, one might say, as well as the Adventist Digital Library. And I just want to emphasize to you there's a window of opportunity here for the ADL to become what librarians would like it to be. Uh, and if ASDAL doesn't act and take a leadership role here, then church leaders are going to say, well, we'll make it what we want it to be. And the two may be the same, but they may not. Um, this is, you know, uh, up to this point, the ADL has sort of been, will it happen, won't it happen? It's no longer a matter of if. Um, by the end of next year, the church, uh, whether directly from GC Treasury or through Andrews, which is a GC institution, however, by the end of next year, the church will have invested over $400,000 in this over a period of four years. Um, so this is, this is going to happen because church leaders wanted to, and now they spend a lot of money on it. Um, and are spending a lot more. So the key is what form does it take? So I would encourage you to take a leadership role here. I hope we can all rise to that challenge and that opportunity. And finally, let's publicize archives and Adventist resources. Are you on Twitter? I know some of you are. The General Conference Archives is at GC Archives. If you don't follow us, please do so. Uh, we have only around 7,000 followers, but then I like to think that's 7,000 people, most of whom didn't know about the General Conference Archives three years ago. Our Facebook page normally gets uh, in the low thousands of views, though again that's people who would otherwise not be seeing the sorts of things we put on Adventist history, but some of our view posts get 30,000 plus views, and there's been a couple, Benjamin, with over 100,000. This is a way of getting Adventist history for us, but also Adventist resources out there, making them widely available. And you could be doing this. Um, you as librarians are ideally situated, in fact, to be providing intelligent and spiritual factoids, photos, and so forth. It's also a way, you know, just to get people used to going to your site, finding out what you offer, but also information. Remember we talked about this is the way, you know, we talked yesterday, why as church leaders now wanting to, to work with you more? It's because we are on the information superhighway, but unfortunately, uh, at times we're sort of veering from side to side. You as librarians can help to supply uh, good resources and direct people, especially young people, to those good resources. And I mean here good not only um, of a high quality, but also morally and ethically, theologically sound and good, so good in the, the widest possible sense. So I would encourage you to promote not only your library but also your archival collection. Think about how you can do it uh, and we're happy to talk with you about ways we can cooperate. So to conclude, I think the prospects for the future are bright. But I think that greater cooperation and collaboration between us and by that I mean both us as members of ASDAL but also between libraries and church administrative organizations uh, are 
Greater vertical and horizontal, you might say, cooperation and collaboration are essential if that prospective future for Adventist archives and manuscript libraries is to be a reality rather than just a vision. Thank you. That's an excellent question. I suppose uh, the answer may, may vary. It seems to me probably really that uh, archivists have are sufficiently close to librarians, especially now that technology is coming into it, that the training should ideally be located in a, in a library school. But I think one has to recognize that training as a librarian, if one only trains in sort of managing books, uh, it doesn't qualify you to deal with archival records. They're, they are they are different. Um, I think history, a history department, the training one receives as an historian is about using these materials. Inevitably one works out, you know, uh, you know, one works out, for example, gosh, I wish they hadn't put that tape on that document 80 years ago, which is now turned brown and discolors the, 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 the words so you can't read them. So historians work things out, but the training for an historian is really in a method of using archives rather than in the technical terms of their preservation and optimal disposition. So I would say it's it better, it, it should come from within. To me, the ideal would be that it would come from within a school of, you know, there's not even a, a good word. Once it would have been librarianship, now it's information science and information management. But I think it comes more logically from that area than from a history department. But, you know, anyone who works with archives, it seems to me, should um, be interested in, in history and be working with historians on how can we... There's all kinds of people who would use a library. On the whole, it tends to be historians who use an archive. So there should be a sustained conversation about how can we make this most useful for you. Uh, because whereas people from all kinds of disciplines and none are patrons of a library, it's chiefly historians who are patrons of an archive. I'd like to, I'm interested in what you mentioned about training, and I see that as an area of cooperation with, between ASDAL and your office, Office of Archives, Right now, we have a lot of webinars that are being held, and the Library of Congress is actually hosting a lot of webinars which I attended, and they are very useful. And if the Office of Archives will look for some qualified archivists who can give training to library or to other people, and us that can contribute, some of us may be able to serve as trainers also to the webinar. And I think that's one plan for the future future that you can arrange for webinars and we can contribute with manpower because we have a lot of institutions outside the United States uh, librarians uh, need some training especially in archiving and we have a lot of institu institutions that are already employing para para professionals because of lack of, lack of uh, resources and management and that's one area that I would like to suggest on that one. Historians can also be and which can uh, help with historians. Also with opening electives in some institutions. And I think Andrews used to have a library science courses before, mm -hmm. but then it's been abolished for some reason. And we can uh, offer electives also, brilliant electives in different institutions mm -hmm. in Walla Walla or in Andrews or whatever that would be uh, looking for cooperation. Yeah, no, thank you. I think it's a pity, you know, actually uh, other Adventist colleges, if one goes back, used to have library degrees as well. I know certainly PUC did going back in the back in the day. Um, 
I know the seminary has a, because I know Merlin teaches it periodically, of course, in, in archives, but there's, you know, there's not very much offered. You're absolutely right, and I think the idea of webinars is an excellent one. There are people in this room who could contribute to archives, webinars, and it's the sort of thing, you know, this is part of, of what we do. Um, people sometimes ask me what I do and whether I miss teaching, and I say, well, actually, I, I do quite a lot of, of training, which is rather like teaching, so it is, I don't miss it for that reason, at least not at the moment. Um, but there's no reason that one shouldn't be able to expand that. And in fact, Gail Gerdel from Helderberg could say, we, we did this, uh, we gave training not only to all the conference uh, and union secretaries and IT directors in the Southern Africa Union, but a group from the library sat in and specifically on archives. Uh, but of course, that's only good for the people in the room. So webinars is an excellent idea. And I, I don't know who would be responsible in ASDAL for uh, talking about how we might do that collaboratively, but certainly we'd be very pleased to do that. Warren, and then... Um, also a question about training. Uh, in addition to webinars and actual workshops, we can have apprenticeships. Do you know of any examples where we've sent a archivist from one division to another or brought them to the GC, given them three to six weeks of on-site training? Is that even feasible? I think it, uh, it's a very interesting idea, Warren. I think it would be. Um, and you know, I, I, now that you've raised it, I can suggest it to divisions who ask us for, for training in the future. In 2016, we will be having um, all the people who work at division record centers and archives here uh, as part of a wider week of training for the GC Secretariat. But that only gets to, to that level. But I think it provides an interesting model, um, and it may be, again, the sort of thing that, that Asdal could talk about uh, sponsoring, and then we could contribute to it and say we're going to have maybe a, a, an advanced school, uh, an intensive, at, because the logical thing would be to have it at an Adventist College University with an archives collection, um, and, and then to, to do something. Uh, I think that's a, an excellent idea. I want to remind folks or tell folks, don't forget your National Archives Association, at least in this country, and I don't know, you know what's available in Nigeria or other places, but like the Society of American Archivists has excellent resources and that you can, one, purchase, but they also offer a continuing, you know, list of um, on-site training, and you can even, um, your institution can host a, you know, a workshop on, you know, a variety of topics. We've done this at Loma Linda several times, and it's wonderful. Otherwise, you know, they hold them, you know, sort of throughout the country. And, you know, like the rare books and manuscripts section of, you know, it has training, the Society of California Archivists has training. There's the Western Archives Institute, um, which is a two-week intensive that you know Chelsea just you know attended, and I sent um, one of my staff for intensive archives training. There's a lot of training out there, and there's a lot of resources and guidebooks and things for learning yes. business. No, I think uh, SAA also, uh, ALA has a rare books and manuscripts section which is quite relevant for those of you who are working with older. You know, there's a distinction here too between, you know, as I refer to the, the you know, records management and archives and manuscripts, these, these are, they're broadly similar, but they're, you're dealing mostly with recent records in a, in a business which includes the church setting where those records may need to be supplied uh, it's rather different to working with purely historical things that only researchers will be using. So uh, ALA's Rare Book and Manuscript section, SA, all, but also what some of you won't be aware of, the Association of Records Managers and Administrators, yeah. Armour International, which is very focused on the current and business model, but has a huge number of online professional courses that one can take. I will say I think there's still a need for training in the church setting because there are particular issues relating to Adventism. And also, you know, just let's be honest, there are certain administrators who will pay for you to go to an Adventist training, which may not, if it's a, a secular training. So, but I think 
If you're working in this area, you should belong to one of the groups we've just mentioned, and there are regional ones as well, as Laurie has said here, it's Marek, the Mid-Atlantic. Um, but there's regional ones and there's national ones. Um, so uh, I think if, if you're working in this area, one should belong to a professional body. Um, how many more questions should I take, Laurie? Call it quits. Yes. Right now, so maybe we can save your future questions yeah. for David to during the break. Yeah, let's. I think let's let's call it have and move to the the break now. Yeah. All right. We might as well. You know, we're supposed to have Heather's paper.